Welcome to the course on plasma physics and application to fusion energy, astrophysics and industry. My name is Duccio Testa and in this lecture we will discuss the tokamak concept. We will start with the main elements and properties of a tokamak. We will look first at the magnetic field and plasma current, then at plasma shaping, at the safety factor and at the equilibrium in a tokamak. We will then describe briefly the largest tokamak currently operating in the world is the jet tokamak in England. And then we will conclude this lecture with a few words on the spherical tokamaks. In this drawing here we see a sketch of the tokamak and of its main element. The first element that we need to talk about is the toroidal field coil. Is this structure here? As its name indicates, the toroidal field coil produce the toroidal field that goes in the toroidal direction. There is a current that flows in the coil, so the field is along the toroidal angle. The second element that we need to discuss is the, way the method to produce the plasma current. We do this by transformer action. What we do, we drive a current in the inner toroidal field coils. These are this green structure here. Yeah. This is the primary of the transformer circuit. The plasma itself, this pink element here, is in fact the secondary of the transformer circuit. So by producing a flux swing through the inner parallel field coils, changing the current, ramping up and down the current in the inner parallel field coils, an electric field is driven in the toroidal direction. This produces the plasma current. The plasma current produces the poloidal magnetic field. The resulting magnetic field is helical because we have a toroidal field in the toroidal direction and a poloidal field. And we see here in black the helical path of the field line. We have then the third element is this gray structure that are wound around the tokamak. These are the outer poloidal field coils and this are used to control the plasma position and the plasma shaping. Now let's explain in more detail the geometry of, the, of a tokamak and we will use this drawing here. A tokamak in fact is a cylinder with its end folded up together. So we have two angles. The first is the toroidal angle phi that goes in the plane of the cylinder. And then we have the poloidal angle theta that describes the plane perpendicular to the toroidal angle phi. Then we can describe the tokamak geometry using effectively two systems of coordinates. The first one is a quasi-Cartesian coordinate system, R, Z, phi, R, the coordinate along the radial direction, Z, the vertical coordinate, phi, the toroidal angle. Or we can use a quasi-cylindrical coordinate, small r, theta phi. Small r is the radius of the poloidal cross-section, theta is the poloidal angle, and phi is again the toroidal angle. You have two main quantities, r0 is the major radius of the tokamak, and then if we consider the last uh, surface in the poloidal cross-section, this has a radius a, this is the minor radius. And the ratio between R0 and A is called the aspect ratio of a tokamak. Now, here again is a sketch of a tokamak. Let's look at the radial dependence of the toroidal field and of the plasma current. Remember, the toroidal field is produced by the toroidal field coil, these structures that are wound around the poloidal cross section. Current flows in this structure. And therefore, the toroidal field has a 1 over R dependence. The toroidal field is higher in the center of the tokamak and is lower towards the outer boundary of the tokamak. This allows us to define the high field side and the low field side of the plasma cross section. Obviously, the toroidal field is higher in this region of the plasma. This is the high field side and is lower in the outer region of the plasma. This is the low field side. Now, what about the plasma current? Well, in a typical tokamak, the plasma temperature is peaked at the center of the poloidal cross section. 
So if we describe, if you look at the radial coordinate, big R, big R goes in this direction. This will be the center of the poloidal cross-section. The plasma temperature, T, is peaked in the center. We know that the resistivity has an inverse dependence with the plasma temperature, so the resistivity is smaller at the center of the poloidal cross-section. And this tells us that the plasma current is larger where the temperature is larger because this is where the plasma resistivity is smaller. This uh, obviously is the typical tokamak situation. There are different methods to produce the plasma current and therefore we may end up with slightly different profile of J. Now let's look at plasma shaping. In particular, plasma shaping is produced by the outer poloidal field coils. So we start from a superposition of magnetic field produced by coils and by current in the plasma. These outer poroidal field coils that are labeled here P2, P3, P4, in fact are used to control the radial position of the plasma, the vertical position of the plasma, and produce plasma shaping. And here we see two examples of possible plasma shaping. The first one, if we produce a quadrupole field using the outer poroidal field coil, then this quadrupole field elongates the plasma. And depending on the polarity, plus on top and bottom, minus, minus, left and right, then we have a plasma that is elongated in the horizontal direction. If we invert the polarity, minus on top and bottom, plus left and right, then we elongate a plasma in the vertical direction. If we have an hexapole magnetic field, then we have a plasma that tends to have a more triangular cross-section, and this is an example taking this polarity of the fields produced by the outer polar field coils, we have a plasma that is triangular towards the right. Plasma shaping is very important because it's one of the possible methods that we have to control instabilities and to optimize the performance of a fusion reactor. Here in Lausanne we have a tokamak, the TCV tokamak. It's Acronym stands for tokamak a configuration variable. It's a tokamak that is optimized for the study of plasma shaping. Here we see a sketch of the TCV tokamak, and here are some examples of the plasma shapes that we have obtained on TCV. TCV is optimized for the study of plasma shaping because we have a large number of outer poroidal field coils. These are indicated with this pink structure on the left and right of our plasma, and we see that by changing the current and the polarity of these, um, of these coils, then we realize really a, an incredible number of plasma shapes. We start from plasma that are rather elongated and sort of quasi-triangular top of the machine, this configuration here, to plasma that are really triangular towards the bottom, again top of the machine, plasma that are basically like a droplet, top of the machine, or droplet, bottom of the machine. So here there is really a huge range of plasma shapes that can be obtained. Now let's look at the MHD equilibrium in a tokamak. That as a reminder, the MHD equilibrium is basically given by the force balance condition, J cross B equal grad P. What this condition tells us is that we have nested flux surfaces that coincide with isobaric surfaces on which the current flows. Here we have a sketch of these flux surfaces that are indicated in blue along the toroidal direction. And we can label these flux surfaces by the value of the magnetic flux psi that is captured by these surfaces. We have an element that tells us the confinement efficiencies is beta, is the ratio between the plasma pressure and T and the magnetic field pressure, B squared over 2 mi naught. Then what we can do, we can express the MHD equilibrium condition as average over flux surfaces and express in terms of the poloidal flux. This leads us to the grad Shafranov equation that we shall so see in the next slide. So let's look again at these two figures to understand what the poloidal flux is. In the top figure, the flux that we are looking at goes along the toroidal direction. So it's the flux of the magnetic field along the toroidal direction that is captured by a surface 
in the poroidal train. And this will be the toroidal flux. The poroidal flux is actually the opposite of it. The poroidal flux, CEP, is the flux that is captured on a poroidal surface, AP, that is limited by a boundary, KT, that is in the toroidal direction. We express the grad chafran equation in terms of the poroidal flux, CEP, because for the solution of the Schafranov equation, we use measurement of magnetic field and fluxes at the plasma edge. And what these measurements are, are measurement of poroidal fluxes. So this is why we express the grad Schafranov equation in terms of the poroidal flux. Here, we have the grad Schafranov equation that basically again starts by the usual equilibrium condition J cross B equal grad P. The equation is here on the top line. We see that it is a very complicated equation that has an operator, delta star. It is an equation in terms of the poroidal flux, C of RZ, which contains two functions, a pressure P and this derivative P prime, and a slightly more complicated function, F and this derivative F prime. F we can say it's a functional of the toroidal field B phi, and F is a function of the flux. This operator delta star we see contains second order derivative with respect to the R and Z coordinate. So this turns out to be an elliptical equation in the flux of two functions P and P prime, F and F prime, that are both function of the magnetic flux, specifically of the poroidal flux. Since we have a derivative, we need boundary condition. And these boundary conditions are provided by measurements of the poroidal and radial magnetic field and fluxes at the plasma edge. For the solution, we start with an initial guess for the pressure and the F function that we provide as function of the flux, C, and using constraints on this solution. The constraints are provided by measurement of the plasma pressure profile by measurement of the profile of the pitch of the magnetic field lines, and all measurement must be expressed in terms of psi, so fitted to flux functions. What we show here in this graph is an example of a solution of the grad Schafranov equation. Again, this orange structure here are the cross section of the coils that are used to produce the fields and shape the plasma and control its position. In this black triangle here, we see we have many around the poroidal cross-section of the plasma are the coils and flux loops indicate the position of the coils and flux loops that are used to measure the magnetic field and fluxes that provide the constraints to the solution of the grad schafranov equation. The solution, what we see here, is expressed in terms of equilibrium flux surfaces. These are equidistant contours of constant pressure and magnetic flux. Using this graph, we can define a few quantities. First thing, we can look at the center of the outermost flux surface. This surface is described by this red line. And we see that the center is here. The position of the center of the outermost flux surface is the magnetic axis. What we see is that if you look, for instance, at the innermost flux surface, this innermost circle here, the center of the innermost flux surface does not coincide with the center of the outermost flux surface. There is a shift, and this is called the Schafranov shift. It's the radial displacement of the center of each surface with respect to the magnetic axis. What we also note is that flux surfaces are more closely spaced on the low field side of the plasma. Now we can look now at a typical equilibrium profiles in Tokamak, and we will take a real case. It is a discharge from the jet Tokamak and we look at profile at a one particular time point. First, in a tokamak, the equilibrium is 2D axis symmetric. And for usual condition or usual operating condition, the pressure P and the toroidal current J phi typically peak on the magnetic axis. The toroidal field B phi, we have seen already, has a one over R dependence, and the ratio between the poroidal and the toroidal field varies from 0, 1 to 0 0.25 by going from the high field side to the low field side. 
the poidal field is uh, zero on the magnetic axis. So here we have a graph of these quantities. In blue is the toroidal field, larger on the high field side of the plasma, smaller on the low field side of the plasma. The plasma pressure is indicated in black line. We see it's picked in the plasma center. It has really a rather wide profile. This is the toroidal current density, J, in green, again picked on the plasma center. And the poroidal field, B theta, is indicated in red, changes side by going through the magnetic axis because the poroidal field, if you move around the poroidal cross-section, obviously goes up on the low-field side and then goes down on the high-field side. So it changes sign by going through the magnetic axis. Now, there is just one more element that allows us to fully describe the tokamak, is the safety factor. So we remember that the field lines follow an helical path around the toroidal direction. And we see this line here describes the field line. So we can define the pitch angle of the magnetic field line is the ratio between the poroidal field and the toroidal field. Then by using the pitch angle, we can define the safety factor and we can take an approximation for large aspect ratio tokamak. It means that R0, the major radius is much larger than A, the minor radius. And we can take the, this condition as uh, average over flux surfaces. The safety factor Q becomes only a function of small r, the minor radius of the poroidal cross-section, and we see that depends on small r divided by r0, the major radius, and this is the ratio between the toroidal and the poroidal field. The importance of the safety factor is that it is a measure of the plasma current contained within the radius small r, and in particular at the plasma edge when r is equal a, the minor radius, the safety factor is inversely proportional to the total plasma current. IP. The safety factor is very important in tokamak because there is a link with the plasma stability. In fact, we find that in tokamak, instabilities are generally associated with the rational values of the safety factor. It's a resonance condition between the perturbation of the magnetic field and the pitch angle of the equilibrium magnetic field. We can usually decompose our perturbation into toroidal n and poroidal m mole number. And the rational values of M over N are therefore described by elements 1, 1, 2, 1, and 3, 2. So if you look here at the stochamac, what would be a 2, 1, M equal to N equal 1 perturbation? It's a perturbation that goes around twice in the poroidal direction M, while only going around once in the toroidal direction. So the M2 N1 component will be a component that, as I said, it goes around twice in the poroidal direction, once in the toroidal direction. So let's look at the perturbation. Let's say we start on these points here. We want to go around twice in the poroidal cross section, once in the toroidal cross section. So we start with this. So this is our 2, 1 perturbation. A 3, 2 perturbation would be a perturbation that goes around three times the poroidal cross-section and once along the toroidal angle. So we start again from here. And there it is. So this will be the 3-2 perturbation, three times in the poroidal direction, two times in the toroidal direction. Now we can look now at a typical safety factor profile in a tokamak, and, and again, we take an example from the jet tokam, the same discharge that we've seen before. The safety factor increases from the plasma center, where Q is typically around 1, towards the edge. This is a typical situation for the safety factor of a monotonic safety factor profile that is linked to a current profile, current density profile J phi, that is picked on the magnetic axis. We can have slightly different current profile that, for instance, can be produced by waves or by pressure gradient. And then the safety factor can actually change. So if you have a current profile that is peak slightly off axis, like this one here, then this will produce a safety factor profile that is 
above one in the plasma center and it has two minima. We have two minima here of the safety factor profile and the value on the plasma center is larger than one. And the one advantage is that since the safety factor is above one in the plasma center, well, we remove all instabilities that are associated to one one mode in the plasma center. However, we have resonant values of the Q profiles or rational values of Q that can appear twice, for instance. Here and here, this would be a three half, a three two resonance. So these are the resonance condition appears twice, and therefore, if the perturbation grows to occupy all this region of the plasma between these two resonance surfaces, then it's a huge perturbation, and this can have significant consequences on the performance of the discharge. Now we can now look at a typical sequence of events in a tokamak discharge. We start with the current in the primary field coils, IPF. It's ramped down to a negative value. Then at some point, we start ramping up towards zero. At this moment, we inject some gas in the plasma, not a lot, around 0 0.01 gram or thereabout. The current in the primary field coils ramp up, and we see that this is, at, this is where the plasma current also starts to ramp up. This is the point where we start having a breakdown. So when the current in the primary field coils goes to a zero, this is what is called the primary reconnection of the current in the inner poidal field coils. And at this moment, we know if the breakdown has been sustained or not. This time scale is very short, typically of the order of a few milliseconds, one to three. If the breakdown has been sustained, we keep up ramping the current in the poidal field coils, plasma current ramps up, and then we get to a flat top, and at the end of the discharge, we ramp it down. For the magnetic field, we usually start with a pre-magnetization. In fact, if you see, the toroidal field starts to ramp up before we ramp up the current in the toroidal field coils. This is uh, the phase that is called the pre-magnetization of the plasma, and this is uh, useful to facilitate the breakdown. We then again have a flat top for the toroidal field, and then the ramp down phase at the end of the discharge. We can now look at a video of a real jet discharge, a real plasma of jet, and we will see flashes of light. This is where and when the plasma is formed. The patches of light indicate where there is radiation from the plasma to the wall. So we see here the plasma is formed here at the bottom, then there are flashes of light goes uh, to the poidal concession, and at this moment the plasma is terminated, is the ramp down phase again at the bottom of the tokamak. We can now talk uh, very briefly about the history of tokamaks. Tokamaks have been used in fusion research since the late 50. In fact, the first tokamak that started operation was the T1 tokamak in 1957 at the Korchatov Institute in Moscow. Now, there are around 40 tokamaks that are currently operating worldwide. We have tokamak in the USA, in Europe, in India, Iran, Brazil, South Korea, China, Japan, and Russia. We will talk a little bit more about the JET tokamak. JET is an acronym, it stands for Joint European Tours. It is in England, close to Oxford. The first jet plasma was in June 1983 and currently is the largest operating tokamak in the world. What we see here is a photo of the inside of the jet tokamak. We superimpose a typical plasma. We see these lights here is where the plasma radiates to the wall, top, bottom and a little bit on the low field side. The jet tokamak is currently the sole operating magnetically confined fusion device which has capability of deuterium-tritium operation. 
One of the main highlights of the JET Tokamak was a 50-50 DT SPRM that was carried out in 1997. During this DT SPRM, we achieve a peak fusion power of around 16 megawatt, this is currently the world record, and a peak fusion energy gain, quality, of order 0 0.62, raised up to 0 0.95, so quite close to 1, when we consider transients. We have here a photo of the jet tokamak, the outside of it, we see lots of elements, and uh, let me just tell you about a few design and operational param parameters. The major radius of the jet tokamak is 3 meter, the minus radius is larger than 1 meter, 1.25 meter. The typical magnetic field and plasma current are 3.5 tesla and 3.5 megampere, but operation is possible up to a value of the magnetic field on the magnetic axis B phi zero of 4 tesla, a plasma current up to 6 megampere. We have additional heating power up to 40 megawatt. Typical value of the electron density and temperature in the plasma center are any not, electron density in the plasma center be 2 and 5, 10 to the 19 particle per meter cube, peak electron temperature and ion temperature in the plasma center between 5 and 15 keV. The typical energy confinement time tau e is of the order of alpha second, and this gives maximum triple product n tau et, which is of the order of 2.6 times 10 to the 20 keV per meter cube per second. We have a flat top pulse length that is between 20 and 60 seconds, and the materials with which the wall of jet are, is built are beryllium and tungsten. Now, jet is an experiment about the physics of fusion, but also about technologies. And one particular technology we'd like to focus on is the remote handling technology. Remote handling enables work inside jet, inside the jet vessel, without human presence inside the jet vessel. Remote handling is carried out by a dexterous force reflecting master slave servo manipulator. The slave unit is transported inside the torus on the head of a 10 meter long articulated robot. And the master unit is driven by experienced operator situated in the control room. We have here a video that shows a few examples of remote handling operation in JET. And particularly, there is a focus on the installation of uh, antennas, the TAE antenna that are used to drive and detect alpha and eye modes on JET. We are particularly keen on this video because the TAE antenna is something that uh, we designed and built here at CRPP in Lausanne. Now, so far, we have described what we normally call the conventional tokamak concept. We see an illustration here. The conventional tokamak concept is a tokamak which has a large aspect ratio. R0 over, over A, typically in excess of 3, between 3 and 4, 3.5, for instance, in the case of JET. The spherical tokamak concept we see here in this graph has an aspect ratio R0 over A that is close to 1, much smaller than a conventional tokamak. We see here, in fact, the relative scales of the spherical tokamak and the conventional tokamak. Here we have an example of a spherical tokamak, again in the UK. The main advantage of a spherical tokamak is that despite the fact that in general we achieve a lower plasma pressure, there is a higher value of, of beta, which is the ratio of the plasma pressure to the magnetic field pressure. And this is because the spherical tokamak is a more compact structure. So the, compact, the magnetic field is more compact and a smaller magnetic field is needed for confinement that basically increases beta. However, we see here in these photos are a discharge from a spherical tokama. The plasma can get really close to this column here. It's called the central column in a spherical tokama. And this is, uh, this central solenoid then is exposed to the plasma and therefore care must be taken for the plasma really not to touch this central solenoid. Now let's summarize our lecture. Tokamaks have been invented in the 50s, and there are around 40 currently operating tokamak worldwide. In a tokamak, the plasma is confined thanks to the superposition of different magnetic fields. For the jet tokamak, it's a DT tokamak. It holds the world record of fusion power and fusion gain, and it is a great example of fusion technologies, for instance, remote handling. It's important to know that tokamak are pulse device. 
the plasma current is driven by transformer action. In the next lecture, we will look at a stellarator that is an example of a confinement that in principle can be steady state.